Hey everybody, Dr. Phil here. So this is a video on relevant costing for managerial decisions. So let's just, let's just jump right into it like we always do. So decision making has five steps. These, are, these five steps are really nothing different than you're used to, than you would use in your personal lives, right? Define the decision, identify alternative actions, collect relevant information, select course of action, and then finally analyze and assess the decision. So let's talk about relevant costs and benefits. Um, so incremental revenues, uh, we would define these as additional revenues generated by selecting one action over another. Incremental costs, these are additional costs incurred if a company pursues a certain course of action. Incremental income is defined as incremental revenues minus incremental costs. And then the decision rule is to choose the alternative that most increases income as you would expect. So let's talk a little more and more about relevant versus irrelevant costs and try to define that a little, a little more. So a sunk cost, these arise from a past decision and cannot be avoided or changed. So sunk costs are irrelevant to current and future decisions. So think about like water under the bridge, you know, like money you've already spent, you can't get it back. It's pretty much irrelevant at this point. Um, out of pocket cost, this requires a future outlay of cash, so therefore, because it's a future outlay of cash, it's not in the past, it's in the future, then these would be relevant. Opportunity cost is the potential benefit lost, <clears throat> excuse me, by taking an action over an alternative action. So opportunity costs um, are always relevant. Um, and a good example of an opportunity cost, just as a quick aside, um, you know, you're all attending college, you're in class, so Believe it or not, you may not realize this, but you understand the idea of opportunity cost because you could have just graduated high school, gone and got a job. You said, no, I want it for whatever reason, I want to go to college. So there's an opportunity cost there associated with the lost wages while you're in college. And then finally, avoidable costs. These can be eliminated by choosing one alternative versus another. So avoidable costs are relevant. So for example, like if you choose A, you avoid the costs associated with B. Conversely, if you choose B, you avoid the costs associated with A, okay? So make or buy analysis. Let's just uh, look at one of these scenarios. There's a few scenarios in this chapter that we're gonna kind of touch on and kind of talk through. So the first one is make or buy analysis. So Fast Track, this is the company, currently buys a key part for $1.20 per unit. The cost to make is $1.05 and includes direct materials, direct labor, and incremental overhead. So we've, we've kind of got the information um, down here, right? So they're currently they're buying it, so there is your buy, right, $1.20 per unit. They're not, if they're buying it, then they don't have to worry about materials, labor, and overhead. Now, what if they buy it themselves? Well, excuse me, what if they make it themselves, right? Then they have materials cost, 35 cents a unit, direct labor, 50 cents per unit, and then overhead incremental only of 20 cents per unit. So the cost per unit is $1.05. So, Based on this, um, the decision would be um, they would make it themselves because they can save 15 cents per unit, right, if they just make it themselves versus spending $1.20 buying it. Next, next type of managerial decision we can look at is what we call sell or process analysis. So companies have to decide whether to sell partially completed products as is or to process them as other products. So basically keep processing them further. The decision depends on the costs and revenues of processing further, and the company will select the action with, as you would expect, with the higher income. So the sell or process analysis, um, so we've got a sort of example here, right? Sell as is. If the company sells whatever the, pro whatever the unit is or product is, it doesn't really matter, then they can, if they sell as is, they can generate 50 grand. There's no cost associated with that, and the income would be 50. Now, if they process further, then they can generate 150, but it also, they've gotta be mindful that it costs them 80,000 extra dollars, right, to do that. So their income would be 70. So here the decision would be, um, the incremental income to process further is of course an extra 20. You sell as is for 50, you process further, you make 70, so there's your extra 20. Um, so obviously in this case, the decision rule would be that the company would process further, right, to generate that extra 20,000. And just as a quick aside right here, the 30,000 of previously incurred costs are excluded from the analysis. But why? Because these costs are sunk costs and are therefore not relevant to the decision. <clears throat> All right, what about scrap or rework? 
So if it, so it's kind of a very, as, as, as it says, this is kind of a variation of seller process is this idea of scrap or rework. Scrap it, get rid of it completely, rework it, typically put it back into an earlier point in production and then have it reworked on to get it to a saleable condition. So often in manufacturing, we have products that do not pass inspection and are therefore defective. We can either scrap them or we can rework them. So the decision rule, of course, as always, is select optioned uh, with the highest income. So if we look at an example here, scrap versus rework. So the revenue from scrap rework units would be 4,000 if they scrap it, if they rework it, it's 15. Now, bear in mind, if they rework it, they have to spend 8,000 doing so. So the income for scrap is four, uh, but if they uh, rework it, then they can generate seven. So of course, the decision here would be, okay, we're gonna rework it because yes, it's gonna cost us 8,000, but we'll ultimately end up with um, an extra 3,000 in additional revenue. Okay, next topic, sales mix when resources are constrained. So when a company sells a variety of products, which of course most companies do, some are likely to be more profitable than others. So some will be, you know, they'll have higher margins on, they'll sell more of others, not so much. So management looks for most profitable sales mix of their products. Of course, it goes without saying, right? If production facilities are limited, producing more of one product will typically mean producing less of others, right? This idea that you only have a finite amount of space and a finite amount of resources, right? So you have to, you have to use, you have to leverage your resources in, in the right order to make sure you make the most money. And, and when I say the right order, that would be making the most profitable things first, then, to, then go down to the next most profitable, then the next, so on and so forth. In this case, management must identify the most profitable combination or sales mix of products, and management focuses on the contribution margin per unit of scarce resource. Okay, so we'll kind of develop that idea here in a second. So let's take a look at an example. So this company makes and sells two models of scooters using the same machines. So Pro, the Pro scooter uses one machine hour per unit. Max uses two machine hours per unit. So we need to determine each product's contribution margin per machine hour. So the way we do this is as follows. So we go ahead and plug in, uh, the, you got your two types of scooter here, Pro and Max. Let's plug in the selling prices, 500 and 750. Variable costs, 350, 550. So we have a contribution margin per unit of 150 for the Pro and 200 for the Max. But now, and before we even go any further, you might stop and look there and say, okay, well, it looks like we should make the Max because the Max has a higher contribution margin per unit. Well, maybe, but there's one other consideration here, which is kind of the crux of, of, the, what, of this topic, which is, well, yeah, maybe like Max is generating more contribution margin per unit, but how long does it take to make? So if you look at the machine hours per unit, the Pro, it only takes one hour, whereas the, uh, the Max, it takes two. So the contribution margin per unit of scarce resource, which is here the machine hour, is 150 compared to 100, right? So if we look at the decision rule, produce the model that yields the highest contribution margin per machine hour until market demand is satisfied, i.e. don't make more than you can sell, just then move to the next thing that you can sell, right? Pro model has a higher contribution margin of $150 per machine hour, that's the scarce resource. The company should thus produce as many units of Pro as possible, but again, only up to market demand, right? Otherwise, they're gonna have a bunch of Pros sitting around that they can't sell. So again, think about this idea of, <clears throat> excuse me, contribution margin, which you see here, right? 150 versus 200, but think about the extra step they're taking here. They're saying, okay, well, it looks like the max has, a, it, max does have a better contribution margin per unit, but it also takes twice as long to make. So if we, if we assume that these, the scarce resource is um, how long it takes to make the unit, i.e. machine hours per unit, then we're looking at a contribution margin per machine hour. The pro is actually a better choice because although it only generates 150 per unit, we can, we can kind of churn those units out more quickly. All right, so let's kind of look at the same thing, but if we look at the last one, this was the sales mix when resources are constrained. What about the sales mix when resources are constrained and the bananas and limited demand, right? So the company makes and sells two models of scooters, just like in the last example, using the same machines, just like before. So Pro uses one machine hour per unit, Max uses two, just like before. So we need to determine each product's contribution margin per machine hour. 
So what we did here, what we did here is now remember we're assuming unlimited demand, kind of kind of unrealistic, but we can go with it. Um, the pro 2,000 units times 150 per unit contribution margin was 300,000. And they would use 2,000 machine hours to do that. So the, the decision rule here is fairly simple, right? If demand for products is unlimited, devote all machine hours to production of the most profitable product. Now, realistically, it's um, the, the, one, the example, the scenario we looked at just before, this one where resources are constrained and, and demand is limited is much more realistic. This is just to sort of show you what you would do if for some reason demand is unlimited. All right, what about when sales mix of resources are constrained and limited demand? So again, they're making two scooters. Um, the Pro is like before, using one machine hour per unit. Max is using two. So let's figure out their contribution margin per machine hour. So we can see uh, Pro, 1200 units times uh, the 150 per unit contribution margin. So that would generate 180,000. And then we're just gonna, we've got 1200 1, machine hours used. And then we have max 400 units uh, times 100 per unit uh, CM contribution margin to generate 40,000. So what we're saying here is we're going to produce the most profitable product per unit of scarce resources up to the point of total demand for that product. And then any excess capacity we have will then go on to the next most profitable product, right? So in this example, Pro is the most profitable, right? So we can basically sell, we can, the demand is 1,200 units. So we may as well go ahead and meet demand. We'll make 1,200 units because that's the most profitable one. There's no reason to make more than that because we wouldn't be able to sell them because there's no more demand. Then we switch to max, which is the next most profitable. And then we would just keep doing that until we've used up our resources. Okay, next thing, segment elimination. So a segment is a candidate for elimination if its CM or contribution margin is less than its avoidable fixed costs. And we'll look, we'll look at an example of this in a second. So avoidable costs are amounts that are eliminated when the segment is eliminated. The segment itself is um, the segment itself is eliminated. Unavoidable costs are amounts that would remain even if the segment was eliminated. And I kind of alluded to this um, earlier in this in this video lecture. So let's take a look at an example. So here we have um, treadmill. We have wellness and we have fitness, right? So we basically have um, three different segments. We've got the sales amounts, we've got the variable costs, we've got the contribution margins, we've got our fixed costs, and then of course we have our income or in some cases loss. So we can see treadmill is losing money, they're losing 10 grand, wellness and fitness um, appear to be profitable. So the decision rule here is a segment should be eliminated if income increases from elimination. It should continue if income decreases from elimination. And you might be thinking, well, wait a minute, like if we eliminate, um, if we eliminate the treadmill line, the segment, well, wouldn't income go up by 10,000? And the answer is not necessarily, it might, but it may not because of these fixed costs. How much of these, how much of the 15,000 fixed costs will actually go away if we eliminate tread the treadmill segment versus continue and then have to be allocated amongst wellness and fitness? So let's take a little bit more of a look at that. Right, so you see the two, the two um, profitable segments here, wellness and fitness, right? If we go back, you can see what the fixed costs were before, 20 and 10, right? You see what they've done. They've basically taken the 15,000 and they've allocated that 15,000 out. Um, wellness got 8,000 of it, right? If you look before, wellness was 20, now it's 28. And then the remaining uh, 5,000, you can see here, uh, excuse me, 3,000 went from, fitness went from 10 in fixed cost up to 13. So what we've done is we've, they've taken that 15,000 fixed cost and they've had to allocate it amongst these two, okay? So as a result, the income now is only 94,000 before it was 95. So although it, you know, at first glance it might seem like a good idea, right? It turns out it's not because you can't get out of those, let me go back, this 15,000 here, if we could get out of that then, or maybe even just some of it, then um, it may be a good idea to eliminate the treadmill line. In this case, um, it would not be a good idea to do that. All right, next, uh, next scenario, keep or replace. So managers must periodically decide whether to keep using a plant asset or to replace it. And this, of course, is a, you know, a, a concern as things get older. So they compare revenues and costs of keeping the old asset versus replacing it with a new asset. 
The decision rule here, fairly straightforward, fairly simple. Replace an asset if overall income increases. Keep the asset if overall income decreases when considering the replacement. <clears throat> so let's take a look at a quick look at an example of this. So Fast Track is considering replacing an existing machine with a new machine. <clears throat> so we have the existing machine data on the left. We have the new machine data on the right. Um, so we have the book value of the existing machine is 20 grand. The variable manufacturing cost per year is 50. There's no salvage value to their existing machine. Currently the selling price is 25 and the remaining useful life is five years. If they buy the new machine, they have to spend 100 grand. But, the ver but notice that the variable manufacturing costs per year are lower, right? 36 compared to 50 for the existing machine. And the useful life is five years, right? So what we're looking at is we're looking at, we don't have to worry about revenues for this. We're looking at the sale. If we sell the um, existing machine, if we replace, then um, we can get 25,000, right? And then, but then if we purchase a new machine, we have to spend 100,000. That's why this is in negative because this is money going out. Um, and then we're also looking at, we're looking at the variable manufacturing costs. And if, just note down here, like I know it says 250 and 180 and you're probably looking at, well, wait a minute, the variable cost said 50 and 36. These are for five years. So 50,000 per year times five is your 250. 36,000 times five is that 180. So then we're just looking at the income and loss. If we keep the machine, then the loss would be uh, 250,000, whereas if we replaced, the loss would be 255. So obviously we're going to choose, uh, the decision rule here is to keep the current machine because it helps us avoid $5,000 worth of loss. All right, let's, let's take a look at now uh, pricing. So the first thing we'll start talking about is what we call normal pricing. So companies can be a price taker or a price setter or more likely somewhere in between is where most companies would fall on that continuum, if you will. So price takers have less control over setting prices. Basically, you think about it like they just take the price that the market you know, assigns. Price setters have more control over setting prices. Price takers use more target pricing type methods, whereas price setters use more like a, sort of a cost plus pricing. So a price setter, let's see, these are some of the characteristics of price setters. If, if you're in a position to set the price, it's probably because you have things like weak competition your unique product, it's well branded, there's high barriers to entry so that a lot of competitors just can't get in. Whereas if you're a price taker, i.e. you're just gonna kind of take the, you know, the price the market assigns, there's probably strong competition compared to weak up here. Product is not unique compared to unique up here. Product is not branded um, and there are low barriers to entry. So really kind of the opposites here, right? Versus setters versus takers. So let's look at some cost plus methods. So cost plus pricing methods are common when companies are price setters. Management just simply adds a markup to the cost to get the sell. And they can do this because if they're setting the price, they can worry more about their costs and then just factor in their margin. And then this is the price, right? Harder to do that if you're, um, if you're sort of a price taker, you've got, to be more, you've got to be more cognizant of your cost because you know the prices can only be this much. You have to then make sure you can get your costs in line to cover them and also to make you know, a certain markup. So number one, or step one, determine total cost per unit. So your total costs are gonna be your product costs plus your selling general and admin costs, like always. Your total cost per unit will then of course just be your total cost from the top, the top line divided by the total units expected to be produced and sold. Step two, determine the dollar market per unit. So the market per unit is calculated as total cost per unit times the market percentage. And then number three, step three, determine selling price per unit. That's gonna be the total cost per unit plus the markup per unit. So as, as an example, because um, again, like, like most things in accounting, it's way easier if you just see an example. So applying the three-step process to determine price. So you can look at this company's costs here, right? We've got our variable costs on the left, we've got fixed on the right. We've got materials, 20, per, these, these are all per unit, 20 bucks a unit. Labor is 16 a unit, overhead is eight a unit. And then uh, selling general and admin, SG&A is six per unit. And then we have fixed costs overhead of 140 and then fixed SG&A of 60. So we can kind of do the math down here, right? Product costs, we've got our numbers times, uh, they're gonna be selling, looks like 10,000 units. So we're just taking all these, the 20, the 16, the eight, and then you can see the sixes down here, multiplying those out. 
And then we get total costs of 700,000, 580 in, um, as part of their fixed overhead and all these other things. And then we got our selling in general of 120, uh, variable and fixed. So total cost of 700, and then divided by 10,000 units to be produced and sold, the total cost per unit is 70. And then we say, okay, well, we want to have a market percentage of 20%, so you can just do 70 times 0.2, or if you just want to get straight to the 84, just do 70 times 1.2, and then you're building in the markup of $14 or 20%. Obviously, this is the same thing, just expressed two different ways. <clears throat> All right, so what about target costing? So target costing can be used when competition is high. So let's say that, so now we're kind of starting, instead of starting with the cost and working our way to the price, now we're starting with the price and kind of working our way back to the, what the cost would have to be. So the expected selling price is 80 bucks a unit. Company wants profit of 14. So obviously you would just have to back that out, right? So they've got to be able to reduce the target cost per unit to 66 in order to meet the market price of 80 and also make their target profit of 14. We can also look at the variable cost method. So for this method, the first thing we do is we figure out the market percentage. That is the target profit plus the total fixed cost divided by the total variable cost. And then number step two, determine the dollar market per unit, which is the variable cost per unit times the market percentage. And then step three, the selling price per unit, which is the variable cost per unit then plus whatever the markup per unit is going to be. And you can kind of see down here that they've, they've taken all these numbers, like right variable cost per unit is 50, then their markup percentage is 68%, pretty high. So the markup per unit is going to be 34, and then they're just going to say, okay, well, variable cost per unit of 50 plus the 34 markup, our selling price would be $84 per unit. Okay, um, almost the last thing we have to cover in this, in this uh, video is special pricing. So every now and again, companies might receive a special offer at prices lower than the normal selling price. So the decision to whether, whether or not to accept special offers should be based on their income effects. The decision rule here, again, fairly simple. Accept the special offer if income increases and reject it if income decreases. So we can see here, we've got a contribution margin format income statement. We've got our sales, we've got our variable costs, our contribution margin. We've got our fixed costs here, and we've got our income of 200,000. So let's say that um, they have an offer um, to earn an additional income of 18,000, right? So they're looking at their sales, they're looking at you know, their direct materials costs, and they're determining that, okay, yep, yeah, if we do this, we can increase our income by 18,000. Think about what the decision rule was. If income increases, then you should accept it. If for some reason it makes your income go down, then you would, you would reject um, any such thing. Now, I will say this too. Special pricing is usually um, only considered when a company, not always, but most times when a company has excess like idle capacity in their manufacturing operations. If you're already producing at full capacity, it's a lot less likely you would even can, like, entertain a special order because to do so might mean that you have to put you know, some of your regular customers kind of on the back burner which they may not appreciate. Most of these special pricing, special orders are only like one-off kind of deals. So, you know, you think about it, right? It doesn't, think about it, it doesn't make sense to risk losing like regular customers just to satisfy one person for one time. Okay, that is the end of this video. Thank you for watching and I will see you all soon.